Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show Professor James Robinson at Harvard University and the author of a fascinating book called Why Nations Fail. So, James, tell me, why do nations fail? And by fail, we mean fail economically because they're organized in what we call extractive ways, having extractive economic institutions underpinned by extractive political institutions. And those are economic institutions that basically impede people's incentives and opportunities, uh, whereas what you need to have to be successful economically is inclusive economic institutions that create incentives and broad based opportunities, you know, but to have those you need to have inclusive political institutions. So the book is about how politics lies behind different economic organizations and the consequences for prosperity. Okay, so let's just take something off the table first, because uh, one of the topics that you talk about, which I just think is such a popular theory that we, we need to uh, discuss it and perhaps debunk it, is that the reason that some places are much more successful than others is based on geographic factors. For example, London and Paris or New York, sitting right on the river, they have great exposure. Crimea, perhaps, uh, has great exposure. But in your book, you suggest that it is political rather than geographical or cultural issues that uh, that that help a country or a city at least to succeed but it makes sense the argument that being near the water should help can you tell us why that's not quite true well i think you know i think that's important i mean i think those things can make you know can make some difference uh you know to to, to your income but that's not the big difference between poor and rich countries you know there's a lot of you know even if you looked at rich countries in western europe there's a lot of variation in levels of prosperity and, you know, Switzerland and Austria do OK, even though they're landlocked. But, you know, it could be that some types of locations are important in stimulating trade and things like that. You know, that's not really the focus of our book, because I think that's probably not the big story. Uh, but, the, you know, it may be a small part of the story. I guess we you know, we try to address these issues of, you know, is it true that Africa is poor because it's in the tropics and you know, the soil's too thin and it has malaria. And, you know, we present different sorts of evidence against these type of geographical uh, views. I think that's just not the big story in terms of explaining uh, comparative levels of economic development. Okay, so let's let's dive in. I, I just wanted to discuss that because I really do think that people often feel that it's just, you know, it's, it's where you come from or, you know, where, where you physically are located that will make such a big difference. So explain to me a little more about how a country that wants to develop more, let's say in Africa, which is really your focus, what could they do today in order to improve their situation? And are they doing it? Well, I think they have to change their their economic institutions. Uh, they have to change the way the economy is organized. But you know, the emphasis in the book is, you know, is that that's, that's a very political process. It means moving political institutions in a more inclusive direction, spreading power more broadly and, you know, creating more effective central states. And, you know, if you ask me, is that happening in sub-Saharan Africa? I think the big picture is uh, no. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think you've seen democratization since uh, the 1990s, but in many cases, that's a very feeble and kind of almost facade democratization. And you don't see this process of state building or institution building that's necessary to have successful economic growth. Well, without the education to back it up, is it really you know, just including a lot more people in the voting pool? Is that going to make a difference? Yeah, I mean, you know, about having inclusive institutions is not just about having an election and, you know, declaring a victory. Uh, you know, I think it's much more than having uh, there's many very dysfunctional democracies. So so having political power that spread broadly in society, you know, is much more than just holding elections. Uh, you know, yes, you need to have public good provision. You need education. You need to have checks and balances and accountability. You need to have, you know, uh, broad empowerment of people in society, you know, so that's, you know, one of the problems in not just in Africa, but many parts of the world with elections, you know, they, the elections are not really a sign that political power is broadly distributed. They can be managed by small elites. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly see, see our fair share of that going on in the Middle East, where a lot of our listeners, where a lot of our listeners are from listening to the show here. We're talking with James Robinson from Harvard, and he wrote a, a fascinating book called Why Nations Fail. James, let's just dive in a little bit more to 
the effective ways of actually solving the problems because you've been talking sort of big terms. I'd like to drill down because with all due respect, the ideas sound very good, but it sounds so impractical to say, well, we're going to change the way things are done uh, and the way they've been done for thousands of years. Is it, is there a hope? In other words, could we hope that what you're, what you're proposing could actually happen to really improve the lives of all these people? Well, I, you know, I think, I think, yeah, I don't know if the theory is optimistic or pessimistic. It depends, you know, what the alternative is. If the alternative is, is a geographical theory, then then I think our theory is is uh, is optimistic. But I think the fact of the matter is that you know, once societies get organised in a particular way, that's very hard to change. And there's many forces, as we point out in the book, that leads those societies to reproduce themselves. I mean, just look at Egypt next door to Israel. You know. There was, uh, you know, there was a, di- a, mil- a dictatorship of President Mubarak with very extractive institutions, monopolies, connect, you know, connections, ca- ma- you know, mattering for everything. What happens, you know, after the Arab Spring? Well, basically, Mubarak 2.0 has recreated itself with the military yet again running the country. I think that just shows you how difficult it is, you know, to change the underlying politics of a and, society. And I think that that leads to exactly what you were saying before, which is elections are not the proof of democracy because the fellow they elected afterwards who they kicked out a Morsi who they kicked out a year later even though he was the democratically elected leader they just didn't like him so much yeah (laughs) I think he was democratically elected I think you know uh, of course that's a very difficult thing to manage a new democracy like that and you know and you know probably many things uh, were done that people regret Uh, but the biggest problem you know was was the hegemonic power of the military in some sense and uh uh, and, you know, and and the fact that, you know, democracy just wasn't stable, really, uh, with that that entrenched power in in um, in Egypt. So. So, you know, I think that's an example of what we call in the book, the iron law of oligarchy, that extractive regimes uh, often tend to reproduce themselves. You know, Tunisia, you know, looks better. And Tunisia is an interesting country, you know, because one of the reasons Tunisia looks more optimistic, you know, is, is, you know, it did experience a period under President Bourguiba of modernization, investment in education. You know, that's an example of sort of idiosyncratic leadership, you could say. But sometimes that does disrupt the equilibrium in a society. So, you know, you can have processes like that. Uh, you know, I don't think you can rely on enlightened leadership to turn you into a developed country. But, you know, in that case, it helps sort of change the status quo a little bit. Is this something that can come from abroad or does it ultimately have to be organically grown? Well, you know, I think you can think of examples where interventions from abroad helped. But I think certainly recent history suggests this is <laughs> very difficult to do. You know, I'm trying to that. give an example. Help me out. Tell me an example where an outside imperial force really you know, did change. Well, maybe it, I, well, I take it. I, South Korea, you know, many yeah. people think that, you know, that, that, that South Korea that the U.S. intervention in South Korea or, you know, MacArthur's reformulation of Japanese institutions at the end of the Second World War, the Constitution, the land reform, breaking up of the big industrial conglomerates. Uh, you know, people say and many Japan, my Japanese friends would say that actually helped to put Japan on a much more inclusive uh, development path. And certainly it experienced very rapid economic growth after that period. So Just what would be the difference between that, let's say, and the American uh, trillion dollar involvement in in Iraq. I think the nature of the society was very different. Uh, you know that Japan was a consolidated, you know, homogeneous state that had already been through a long process of state building, national consolidation, building modern institutions, fiscal institutions. You know, Iraq has never been a state. You know, it's never been a nation state. It's always been a, her- a very heterogeneous, you know, kaleidoscopic. Uh, patchwork quilt of peoples and societies and ethnic groups and you know and you know that was managed in post-independence Iraq by the military by Saddam Hussein and you know what that that, it was a very very difficult uh, situation in which to create the democracy that you know the United States thought that they were going to be able to create. So today when you know certainly we see the U.S. and the 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 polls in the U.S. certainly seem to be that the Americans are very, very hesitant to get at all involved in anything going out on outside the United States. Do you think it's because they feel that America just doesn't have the ability to influence or the countries in which they should be making an influence are not really the right cultures to accept the, the, uh, the American ideals? 
Yeah, I don't know that it's got much to do with culture. I mean, I think it would be the same in in Africa or, you know, many parts of the world, you know, or Burma or the Philippines, you know, where where you don't have sort of consolidated legitimate central states where, you know, you have all sorts of uh, alternative centers of power and authority. And, you know, I, I, you know, I think that the Americans sort of, you know, blundered into this uh, in, in Iraq and uh, and, you know, now there's some, you know, hesitancy and, and, and hopefully they will learn from their experiences, you know, and and not repeat the, the same, uh, not repeat the whole experience again. You know, mm-hmm. but like what strategy will, you know, will uh, cope with this problem in the north of Iraq and eastern Syria? I, I don't know. And it'll be an incredible irony if the Western countries, after having thought about whether they should arm, you know, Assad's enemies are now thinking of what end up arming Assad against the IS. You know, won't that be a historical irony? All right. So we, we're nearing the end of our time, but this is, in fact, an investment show. So so let's and I, by the way, I have to tell you, as an investment advisor, and my day job is that uh, I, I work with people as a financial planner and investment advisor. And I often hear of people asking me or funds that invest in Africa, and they say, you know, it's the next big thing. It's just not there yet. Based on your spending time there and the the societies and the work that you've done, do you think that there is a a reason that people should be looking at Africa as a real investment target? Well, I mean, I think you can always make money, you know, if you invest in natural resource wealth, if you can manage the, you know, if you can manage the situation, uh, you know, where, you know, where do I see economic dynamism coming in, uh, uh, you know, Africa? I, yeah, I would have said, you know, the one place which is very dynamic in many ways is Nigeria. You know, you go to the south of Nigeria, Lagos is booming. You know, it's transformed itself in the last decade, that city. There's a lot of energy uh, and dynamism in Nigeria. But the north of the country, of course, is falling to pieces. So, you know, quite how that is going to play out in the next few years is a bit hard to know. Um, I, you know, my general view would be, you know, unless you're investing in natural resource wealth, uh, it's hard to see, it's hard for me to see, you know, where one would profitably make money in Africa. I mean, there's niches, you know, doing well here and there, but, but generally the picture I think is fairly, uh, fairly. Right. I was hoping to end on an optimistic note, but we won't because we're out of time. (laughs) We've been talking with Professor James Robinson at Harvard, and he's the author of Why Nations Fail. In the last few seconds, can you just tell us, James, how can people follow you and your work? Great. Yes. Well, we have a blog, whynationsfail.com, where we blog about all sorts of things related to our book. And, you know, reading the book is really the way to get a handle on how we think about the world and uh, maybe how to apply it to the things that you're interested in. All right, fabulous. And we will put a link to that at the show notes at goldsteinongelt.com. James Robinson, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show. 